Good morning. Nice to see everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am Pastor Chris. This is First Baptist Church in Cambridge, Maryland. We're grateful that you could be here with us in person or if you're joining us on the live stream. I just wanted to bring to your attention that we have these flowers out here uh, in front. Uh, we're acknowledging that these are to honor uh, John Marshall. Um, I want to share with you some announcements and then pray for the Lord's presence on our service. So we have uh, adult Sunday schools, 9.15 a.m. Um, please join us for Sunday school. We're going through the London Baptist Confession of Faith, and uh, we are currently on the doctrine of God's decree. We are also having corporate prayer on Wednesday nights. Uh, Wednesday night service starts at 6.30. Come join us for some Bible teaching and for prayer. We also have an Easter egg hunt coming up on April 1st. As you can see in the details of your bulletin in the center panel, uh, we're looking, I guess, for some volunteers, and uh, we could also use some things donated. Please check that out. If, if you feel so led, help us out. Um, I'm not sure. What is the occasion? Um, is this an anniversary of, of Mr. Marshall's yeah. his passing? Today is the anniversary? or Last, last Sunday. Oh. So last Sunday was... was uh, the anniversary of Mr. Marshall's passing, of course, a pillar in the church. The whole family um, has been very special and important to the church for a very long time. Um, so that's why the flowers are here, and uh, we hope that you enjoy them and, and you remember. Right now, of course, he's rejoicing in the choir of heaven. So um, it's, it's, we miss him, but he's, uh, he's doing just fine, <laughs> um, and we look forward to joining him. So... Um, Please uh, bow your heads in prayer with me as we call the Lord and petition Him to rest heavily on His worship service for His fame. Lord God, um, mm, You are a glorious Savior. You need nothing. You need no one. But You have chosen in Your great wisdom to share Yourself with us, Your church, whom You have purchased through your cross. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Help us to love you. Now, we can't know you and love you the way that we've been called to without your spirit. Without your spirit, this is hopeless and foolish, and this is just us playing a little game called church. So, Lord, be with us today. Work in our hearts, humility, trust, sincerity, conviction, repentance as needed, contrition. Let us have a trembling heart before your word that we might pursue you to know you and love you because you saved us. You made us and you saved us for your glory as we come to know you through your word and the person and work of Christ. Be with us, Holy Spirit, and be glorified, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. You can all stand. We're going to be singing a new song today. It's new for our church. It's called Your Will Be Done. Our first time doing it, but I've been told not our last time doing it, right? So we'll all learn it together. Um, if you know it, sing loud. I'm going to sing a little extra loud to help us all out. And uh, if you know it, sing loud. If you don't know it, it's written in hymn style. So all four verses are exactly the same with the melody. So I think you'll, you'll pick it up by the, what, the second or third verse maybe, right? <laughs> all right, yeah, we can stand and we'll sing this together. Me see. 
A reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 11. And the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their boughs. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice. Upright men will see his face. We stand for grace greater than our sin.
our holy, righteous, awesome, and most worthy God, rightly, Lord, have you declared that we, in and of ourselves, have no right to stand before you or in your presence, Lord. For you are holy, Lord, and we are sinful. But you, Lord, in your goodness, have, do not only exercise justice, but you have chosen, Lord, to show your people mercy. And you have wrought salvation in your own strength, wisdom, and power. In the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and current enthronement of your Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Help us, Lord, to see your glory. Humble us, Father, that we would know and love you and fear you rightly and hate our sin. We thank you, Lord, for your continuous provision and your grace to us, particularly, Lord, through these monetary gifts, Father, that we now give back for your service, Lord, for your, for your will to be done here in this church and in Cambridge. And we ask, Lord, please fill your people with the great fire of your spirit, Lord, that we would go out and that our hearts, our lives, and this money, Lord, would be used for the fame of your worthy name here in Cambridge, Maryland. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. Hello again. We are continuing our series in Ephesians. We are now come to the final passage of the first half of the book, um, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Please stand with me for the reading of God's authoritative, glorious word as we read Ephesians 3, 14 to 21.
verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, please bless the reading, hearing digestion of your word to our hearts and our lives, that you might be glorified in this sermon, in this time together. In your name we pray. Amen. So um, I've handed out to you uh, two two handouts. One is uh, a passage outline. If you don't have these two handouts in addition to the bulletin, Please feel free to raise your hand and uh, someone will bring them to you. I see uh, one over here. If anyone still needs these two handouts in addition to the bulletin. So what we have is, one of them is uh, a passage outline. It's kind of a, a, a high level but detailed passage outline um, to help you to look at the passage. This is for your own edification. You can kind of look back and forth between uh, your sermon notes and this, or you could look at it later, but it just lays out the, uh, the basic outline of the passage. That's called Strength for the Christian Life is the name of the sermon, and it says passage outline. But then you also should have another handout called Sermon Notes, and that has the sermon title at the top. It says Strength for the Christian Life Sermon Notes. Sermon Notes. Everybody has those? Good. So, if you look at this uh, sermon notes page, we've broken it down here, asking three things in the intro at the very top. What is the purpose of this passage? What are the parts of the passage? And what is the point of the passage? So you can see all three of those uh, listed below. You can see all three of those listed below. Um, The introduction is where we're starting. Um, So the passage, the purpose. Paul is telling us why he has given us all this deep theology. Now remember, as I've said before, Ephesians, it's laid out in two halves. It's very symmetrical. The first half, three chapters, deals with deep theology, beautiful, glorious theology. And then the next half, he pivots and he says, okay, so on the basis of all that glorious theology that I've shared with you, now how should we then live? How should it impact us? What do we do with it? So this passage, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, it's the last passage in that first half of theology. And he's telling you essentially Number one, why he gave you all the deep theology. And then number two, how that theology translates into you living the Christian life. He's now going to make commandments, demands on your life. Therefore, because of this glorious grace and this beautiful, uh, breathtaking God who I've revealed to you in these first three chapters, how, how then should that knowledge impact and empower and drive and inform you? to pursue these high ethical standards that Paul's going to lay out in the next and final three chapters of Ephesians. I had a thought. It's kind of like the two halves of Ephesians reminds me of the layout of the Ten Commandments. Roughly the first tablet, first five-ish commandments, talks about what? Love the Lord your God, right? With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So the first half of Ephesians, kind of like that first tablet, lays out the glory of God, 
to the praise of his glorious grace, as it says in Ephesians 1. He's revealing to you, Paul, the apostle, all this wonderful truth about the gospel, about who God is, about his saving plan, about his church, about his creation. And then, like the second tablet of, stone, of, of, of the Ten Commandments, the first tablet, love the Lord your God. The second tablet, love your neighbor. Well, the, the last three chapters of Ephesians is kind of like that second tablet. Therefore, based on all that glorious gospel and theology that should cause you to be grateful and humble, to love your God, to trust your God, knowing your God will be the engine to drive you to that life of moral good works described in the second half. So you see that uh, the passage is broken into three parts. If you look in the middle of that uh, sermon notes page, it says passage structure. So it, it opens with an address to the Father, briefly, 3.14 to 15. And then there are three prayer requests from Paul, all about what this theology that we've been talking about for, for these many weeks is supposed to do, how it's supposed to empower you. And then he closes in verses 20 to 21. You see number three there under passage structure with adoration, with the doxology, the appropriate response, the point of all this, to love God's glory, to praise him for his glorious grace. And so what is the point of the passage? If you look at the bottom of that page, sermon notes, I've, I've laid out a, a quick summary of the passage. Man, that's awesome. We've got a little kid running down the aisle. I, I would like that to be epidemic. Like if there could be like a herd of them, that would be glorious. A child stampede would, be, would fit this church perfectly. So what I've written there. I'll read it. Christ dwells in us. This is the point. Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit who grounds us in and strengthens us to grasp the love of God. The love of God in the gospel. We are called by faith to pursue the fullest experience of Christ in us through comprehension of his love. Through comprehending his love. How do we do that? In his word. We pursue his word. We pursue him in his word. So we will be empowered to fully love and follow God more and more and more with our inner hearts first and our outer lives as a result. That's what the passage is all about. That's what the passage is all about. So now what I'm going to do is walk through this passage like we do. We're, we have a conviction that the main diet is to walk through passages verse by verse because this is the inspired, holy, authoritative, powerful word of God. So there's benefit for me walking verse by verse to unpack it to help you to understand and tie all this together. All right, so starting. Uh, this, is, this passage is Paul's second intercessory prayer. Intercessory means going between. Paul praying for you, showing you how to pray, what to pray, what to pray for, what to want, right? So this is his second intercessory prayer in the book. And he opens that prayer addressing the Father, right? He opens that prayer addressing the Father. So what, how does he start? He starts with the words, for this reason, that tips you off. That ties back to verse 3-1. How does verse 3-1 start? For this reason. What reason? Well, Paul started to pray in verse 3-1. And then he went on what we call like a digression for 13 verses. We just got done preaching through that. It's like a parenthesis. It's a digression. It's, it's, he, he went on excursus would be the fancy word. And he started talking about the mystery of the gospel that he's been given a stewardship over to preach and his role and the glory of God in it. And so when he says for this reason, he's picking up again with that prayer after that digression. And in that prayer, when he says for this reason, he's looking back for what reason we have to ask. 
For what reason is he now going to pray to the Father? Well, most specifically and immediately, the reason given for his prayer, the thing driving his prayer, is all the great glorious theology in the passage from 2.11 to 22. And then really 3.1 to, to now, to, to, through 13. So that's the most immediate reference. He's referring to that glorious theology. But if you want to go even further in the chain, like what is he talking about, this whole for this reason business? In that theology, he's tying together everything he said in the, in the, in the book so far. So for the reason of all the glory, all the wonderful grace, all that he's revealed to you so far in this book, he now turns to the Father and he models prayer for you and models your priorities for you to teach you. This is how you should think, what you should want, what you should do, how you will use all this theology. Not to get a doctorate, not to impress your friends, not to look down on anybody. But you're going to use all this glorious theology and you're going to pursue it to know and love your God for the glory of God. That's the reason that Paul bows his knees to the Father. So, he starts out by saying, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father. And so you see, in, in the bowing of his knees, he is demonstrating some things. Humility. Submission. Can you think of any other things? When he says, for this reason, I bow my knees, he's saying he's going to do what? He's going to pray. I bow my knees. So now I'm going to pray. I've just told you all these glorious things about God. I've revealed the gospel in great depth. And what are the things that he revealed? What kind of topics are touched on in these first three chapters? The reason driving his prayer. Well, pretty much everything. Categorically, you could argue he's touched on everything in theology. He's touched on, he's talked about uh, the doctrines of grace He's talked about that sticky, sometimes offensive word, predestination, election. He's talked about the nature of the church, the, the point of Israel, the great mystery, the kingdom of God, union with Christ. I'm listing things that he's mentioned. So in a sense, he's touched on from a high-level perspective in these first three chapters What's driving this prayer is all the theology. Categorically, you could tie this out, these first three chapters, to every topic in a book of theology, systematic theology. Very important for you to know, because this is not for the professional theologian. It's not for the pastor. It's not for a certain kind of personality. All of this glorious theology is for the saints. You're going to see this. He's going, to, he's going to say this explicitly coming soon. So he takes a posture with the bowed knee. It's, it communicates that he's going to pray. It communicates allegiance. This is what your response should be to all that great theology, to all that deep, mind-bending, beautiful, glorious grace about the Trinity. It should lead you to Paul's posture, Bending the knee, submission, loyalty, allegiance, gratitude, humility. You could probably go on. And he, he then gives you some information about the one to whom he's praying. Notice, just like the Lord's Prayer, he prays to the Father. Is there are roles among the Trinity, right? And so God has saved you to relate to him as Father, we are a family. We are adopted. We are children. We are to know him and love him most basically as father. Children looking to a father. And he's described then as the one from whom what every family where heaven and on earth gets its name. 
This, this description of God the Father is not just a little throwaway that he tucked in there because he it felt like it. This is actually to help you to think worshipfully about God. The one that you're now going to turn to and pray to and submit to, humble yourself before. He's the one from whom all things, when we say get their name, both in heaven and earth, it's a picture of your identity. Everything in all of the universe is named by God. Just like God told Adam to, to name the animals, to, to basically take dominion, take rule, to be a vice regent, to be a king over the world. Adam, name everything. Name it. Why? God wasn't creative enough to give names to the animals? Maybe God forgot to do that. Adam, pick up the slack. Like, son, go take out the garbage. Son, go name the animals. No, it's a picture of the way he is God's image in the world as his vice king, vice regent. Adam, name the animals because you will rule the world as my image. So when it says that we're turning, we're bowing to pray to this glorious father, he's identified then as the one who has dominion over all of reality. Everything gets its identity, is named by him, from him. Everything depends on him. That's who you're turning to pray to and depend on. So then, after he identifies the father, and that it's, he's the one who everything gets its identity from, so this is the all-powerful God, he then has requests. He has three major requests, and you can see them. I listed the verses. If you look in your outline, the first one is 316 to 17. You see that? And then the next one, 318 to 19a. And the last one is 319b. A and B just means the two halves of the verse. So that first request, Paul's first request, he says, so I pray that this is like bookends. He starts here again, as he always does, with what? The riches of his, his glory. Paul is fixated on the glory of God. And you'll see at the end of this prayer, he goes right back to what? His glory. That's the whole point. For your life, for your heart, your inner life to be full of Christ through knowledge from this word, so that your outer life will be full of Christ for the glory of God. The whole ballgame. So he starts with, he's asking, he's petitioning, a posture of humility. He needs God, and that's the constant posture of the Christian. We need God. So he asks that God might grant a gift that he might do this. And why? For the riches of his glory. So in one sense, he brings up the riches of his glory that A, everything is for the glory of God. That's what he's praying for. If he's not praying for that, he's very mixed up and he's on the wrong track. And that's a model for me and you. If you're making decisions, if you're talking, if you're acting, if you're feeling, and it's not for the glory of God, that needs to be reformed. That needs to be reformed. So, he is asking the Father, on the one hand, for the glory of God, but also according to the riches of his glory. Look, since Paul doesn't explain what he means exactly, he doesn't say, okay, now I'm going to give you a little side paragraph explaining what I mean about according to the riches of God's glory. We, where are we going to go to find out what he means to, when he throws in that little uh, uh, phrase, according to the riches of God's glory? How could we determine what he has in mind? I just said one reason. Clearly, it's for the glory of God that he's praying these things. That's the ultimate goal. How did I know that? I mean, the first chapter, he said, this is all for the praise of his glorious grace. He's done all this. He's showing it to you. He's calling you to meditate on it and to rely on this gospel and to care about these details, to pursue them, to hide them in your heart, to love these truths, these details. 
for the glory of God. So we know from Paul's teaching in the book and in general that he has that in mind, that this is for the glory of God. And we also know from his teaching, though, that according to the glory of God also means that according to the glory of God, you seeing the glory of God will impact what he's asking for. You seeing the glory of God, the riches of his glory, he qualifies it. He describes them as riches. What are riches for? People gather riches. People love riches. People want riches. So it's not just for the glory of God that he's going to pray these things, but through God's glory, you will be empowered. Through beholding God's glory, you will fall in love with your God. Through God's glory, according to these riches, you will be empowered and transformed. Those are two truths, Pauline truths, that you can take to the bank, and they are here. This is loaded with, pregnant with these truths. So he's asking God on that basis, for God's glory, and through God's glory, through the instrument of you seeing God's glory. And where do you see it? Where do you encounter God's glory? Right, everywhere, but how do you have the, 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 the right eyes to see God's glory everywhere? Yeah, people are saying the right thing. In his word, we have got to be radically word-centered people. If you know that you were made to be radically God-centered, then amen, you know you were made to be radically word-centered. Not to do what's right in your own eyes, like a heathen, but to do what God reveals, because you know the God revealed, and he is your treasure. He is riches. You see his glory in this word, in the person and work of Christ. Now, Paul's going to go after this and unpack this in his requests. He's, remember, he's modeling for you in these three big requests and the details how you should pray, how you should think, how you should take hold of and harness God's glory his glorious grace, to propel you, to empower you to be what he saved you to be, to live the life he saved you to live. Number one, mm, I'm parched today for some reason. I, I don't know why. Pardon me. It's good coffee though. Thank you for the um, uh, snacks team. I appreciate that. <laughs> Number one, he says that according to the riches of his glory, he might grant for you what? A, to be strengthened with power. To be strengthened with power. How? What kind of power is he talking about? Strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit. Now, people have some very twisted ideas about this. So it says strengthened with power. He's praying you'll be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit. Where? Where? Up in the clouds? In a couple parts of your life? When you're at work just only? Where does he want you to be strengthened with power through his spirit? What does it say there? We're talking about verses 3, 16 to 17. We're at the very beginning of it. To be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner person. So your heart, sincerity, your internal life determines, your external life determines whether your church flourishes as a result of your instrumental contribution. I'll tell you what, God has ordained that the church should flourish in part by you giving money, recognizing that your assets are God's assets, and so he works through that. The lights go off if you don't give. But you know what it's called when there's just money and funding and not an inner life of worship? A dumpster fire. A spiritual dumpster fire. We don't want a well-funded spiritual dumpster fire. We want the main thing, the thing that it's all about. At the center of our universe as a local church is the inner life of God in us. Christ in us. Through his spirit. 
So he wants you to be strengthened with power, and you're going to get a sense of how this happens. Now, is this power like so you can shoot fireballs out of your hands? <laughs> Maybe you could have laser eyes, and you could cut Pastor Chris right in half. Zzz. I'd be toast by now if that were true. Oh, boy. Is that what it's for? Is that what the power means? Maybe it's the power so that you can raise the dead, and you could be a really impressive miracle worker. Is that what he has in mind? This power that he's talking about, he qualifies it. He's going to tell you in verses 3, 18 to 19 what it's for. It's to comprehend. To comprehend. Just giving you a taste, to comprehend. So if you continue along with 3, 16 to 17, he said he wants you, he's praying that God would grant for you to be strengthened through his spirit in your inner person. So does that mean, so who's he talking about? Is he talking about pagans? Who's he talking about? Aliens? Space people? Christians. Christians. Is there any such thing as a true Christian without the Holy Spirit? No. There are no Christians without the Holy Spirit. So is Paul, why is Paul, is Paul mixed up? He's praying that you Christians would have the Holy Spirit? That you would have Christ dwelling in you? No, of course. He knows that if you're Christians, you already have Christ dwelling in you through the Holy Spirit representing Christ to you. But he's showing you that to live the Christian life, you have to willfully take hold of this reality. It says through faith. So by faith, you have to believe what he said. You have to believe his gospel. You have to believe that he's graciously united you to Christ and that he's graciously put himself in you. Christ is in you through the Holy Spirit. And so now he's not talking about that happening. He's not talking about you getting the Holy Spirit, you getting Christ in you. He's talking about you actually knowing it and experiencing Christ in you through the Spirit. That's what he wants. He's modeling for you that you must want this too. And you must actually pursue it. You won't just fall out of head, bed and bump your head on the Holy Spirit. You need to pursue Christ in you, who is the Holy Spirit representing Christ to you, teaching you, revealing Christ, empowering you. You have to want this and pursue this, pray for this, live for this, cultivate this, Know that this is the, 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 the stuff of your high, 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 high calling. This is your whole world. The one who names every family on hev in heaven and earth. When he says in heaven and earth, people get into weeds there. They're like, who's in heaven? Huh? So is he's the father of people in heaven. So like angels, they're missing the point. That's called a merism. To say he's the father who names, the one who names everything from heaven and earth, is to show you a spectrum. Everything from heaven to earth. In other words, what does he name? Everything. Everything. This is the one you are to pursue. Everything's about him, for him, through him, to him. And you are to pursue Christ in you, the power of the Spirit, to be strengthened, not to shoot fireballs out of your hands, not to impress people, not to magically just, um, you know, have a, a, all the power to just do all the right moral things. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying pray that you'll have the power to act like a perfect Christian, regardless of what you know. You'll find that nowhere in the Bible. Because that's not what a perfect Christian is. A perfect Christian is not someone who does outwardly moral things. A person who does outwardly moral things but doesn't know and love God and doesn't have the word of God just like dripping out of every portion of their being. You know what the name is for that? A person who does moral things and looks like a Christian outwardly but does not have an internal life in the spirit. You know what they call that? Good. Someone said, a hypocrite. That's what we call a hypocrite. You're not pursuing your calling. If you're merely externally moral, and you don't know the power of the Spirit, and you don't know Christ living in you, and you're not pursuing Christ in you to cultivate that experience, that's called a hypocrite. You could be an immature Christian, but you should be quite scared 
Because that is not why Christ saves people. Christ saves you, as Paul is modeling here, to live in a posture of your knees bent in loyalty, in, in allegiance, in humility, in worship. The knees of your heart should be bent and you should be passionately pursuing your new identity. He's named everything in heaven and on earth and now he's named you son or daughter, worshiper, God lover. So you see two parallels. The, the first thing that he asks in that first request when he asks that God might grant you something, number one, he, grant, he asks, grant that you be strengthened with power through the spirit in your inner heart, in your, in your inner person. But then there's a parallel there, and they explain each other. He says, to have Christ dwelling. I'm paraphrasing here. That you would have Christ dwelling in you. So it's the first one is strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner person. The next one is um, within that same request, to have Christ dwelling through faith in your hearts. So you see the parallel there? Through the Spirit, through faith. In your inner person, in your hearts. What's your heart? Is your heart just your feelings in Bible, biblical talk? Your heart's just how you feel? No, in, in the Bible, your heart is your inner world. That's where everything starts. That's the money ball. You need to get this one right. Your inner life is everything because everything else depends on this inner life, this inner sincerity. And he tells you about how this works. Through his spirit. Well, how, how do you have the power of his spirit? You just sit around and wait? Maybe you, you chant? You chant? You meditate? Oh, mum, 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 Holy, 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 holy. And the Holy Spirit does stuff? No. The parallel there is through his spirit, through faith. So faith, what is biblical faith? Reliance. You're relying on him. Can you rely on him and love him if you don't know? If you don't know him, can you rely on him? Do you rely on things you, have, you, you just don't know? I mean, there's a sense in which, I mean, like I might not know how the boards under this rug work and I'm relying on them to hold me up. That's true. But not in a way that glorifies God. He wants you to know about those boards under this carpet, that he is the floor under your reality, upholding everything. He wants you to know it, he wants you to know it in detail, and he wants you to savor and love it, that he is the holy God, what he has done in Christ, and what he's doing. He wants you to partake in it, to pursue being strengthened by power in your inner person, namely in your heart, through his spirit, namely by faith, which is reliance on truths that you have to know to rely on. You can't adore something that you don't know, nor can you rely on it. And that's why he ends that first request basically by saying, thus being rooted and grounded in love. Christ in you, God uniting you to Christ, him giving you his Holy Spirit, legally binding you to Christ, giving you a new identity, sealing you with Christ through the Holy Spirit, that is the foundation of God's love. But that's not where you stop. When it says, literally the words are being rooted and being grounded. The word for grounded is also the, the Greek word for foundation. What do you do with a root? It's saying being rooted and grounded in love. What, what do you do with a root? You say, okay, we got a root. Cool, let's go. Call it a day. What's a root for? To grow. To grow stuff. What's a foundation for? Oh, that's a lovely foundation. Look, our whole town's full of foundations. There's nothing on them, but they're foundations. Do we want to be a church loaded with roots and foundations and nothing on them? Oh, look at that root. There's no bush, no fruit. Oh, look at that foundation. It's just a nice, beautiful slab. Oh, it's, it's cold. It feels cold on my cheek. I love this slab. Is that what a foundation's for? What do you do with the foundation? You build. The idea is you are grounded in the love of God by Christ in you, the Holy Spirit representing Christ in you, so that you are empowered. How? 
with motive. You have a new nature. You have a new desire. You have a new motive. You want to pursue your new identity and calling. You want to chase after God in his word to understand, to know him, to rely on him, to love him. And so the Christian is rooted and grounded in the love of God through that union with Christ. And that is just the beginning. That's just our start. From the root, we are to pursue and cultivate growth together. And from the foundation, we are to pursue and cultivate a building. And he told us already in this book what the building is. What's the temple of God, according to Paul here in Ephesians? The people. The people. We need to be pursuing Christ in us. How? The power is the new motive, the new nature, a new desire. But you, Paul is modeling for you, must pray for this, live in a posture of knees bent, and pursue this calling to build on the foundation, to grow from the root fruits. So we learn more about this when we get into the next request. Where's that next request? The first one was that. He might grant you. The next one is so that. So it's purpose. So it's really related to the first one. It's telling you more. In verses 318 to 19. 318 to 19. Thank you, brother. 318 to 19. So that. So what follows then? This this is complementary to what he already asked for. So that you might have strength. So he wants you to be strengthened in your inner being. Through faith. So you will experience the Holy Spirit in you. Who is Christ to you. And how will that happen? Now is the big reveal. Now is the big reveal. He's, this is where he's pulling it together for you to get clarity. It's just going to be, again, from you, uh, meditate, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. No. It's all about knowledge. Not knowledge for the sake of itself. Not knowledge to be puffed up. Not knowledge to brag or be proud. But knowledge to know and love and to rely. To grow and build. So he says... So that you might have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. They have strength to comprehend with all the saints. So comprehension that you must understand that presupposes that you're actually going to work at this. You're going to want this. You're trying to grow to know theology. Like the first three chapters of Ephesians loaded with things. Beautiful, glorious truth that tells you who God is through his actions in saving. And notice it says, with the saints. Again, like asking, what does he mean when he says, according to the riches of his glory? You might ask, okay, what does he mean here with the saints? He doesn't stop and explain exactly what he has in mind. But we know from the rest of the book and from Paul's teaching, with the saints. So the idea is this is number one. Number one, when he says, with all the saints, this is for you. This is for everyone. He doesn't stop and say that you may have strength to comprehend you, the pastor, the vocational minister. That's not what he said. He doesn't say that you may have strength to comprehend you, the Bible scholar at the seminary. He doesn't say that you may have strength to comprehend you, the author. He doesn't say that you may have strength to comprehend you, the personality that's bookish and intellectual. Now, does he? Who does he say? All the saints. So there's something else from Paul's teaching in this book and elsewhere that we could take. Not only is this for all the saints, for everyone who's born again, it excludes no one. It includes all of you. Everyone who names Christ, this is for you. Pursuit of this comprehension. With all the saints also indicates the way and context of how you will pursue him to comprehend. In the church. 
with the saints that together through Bible studies, through Sunday schools, through Wednesday night teachings and prayers, through our friendships, we are mutually discipling each other, building each other up, encouraging each other, praying that God might grant us to be strengthened with strength in our inner beings by the knowledge of and experience of Christ through the Holy Spirit, by faith, by reliance on Him. And reliance on Him looks like a hunger to pursue Him. We don't set aside this theology stuff and relegate it to certain personality types. Ah, that's deep stuff, Chris. That's not my thing. It is your thing. You are the saints. This is your identity, your calling. And what does he want you to know? So in all this theology, for you to be empowered to actually execute the next three chapters of Ephesians, which is Christian living, morality that is worship rather than hypocrisy and mere externalism, what does he want you to do? He gives you more information about how this is going to work. He wants you, by this new nature in you, he wants you to willfully, willingly pursue him to, to comprehend to know his word, to know theology, to see the riches of his glory and to love them, to make them your own. And this is all about in everything he's revealing you to himself to you. And as a Christian, he's revealing love. The ultimate. He is love. And he has expressed love through the, the freely giving his son to be sacrificed because you did not naturally pursue this mission. You were made in his image for this mission. Adam was made for this. This is not a new development. This isn't God going back to the drawing board. We were all made in God's image to delight in him, to know him, so we would rely on him and live in a posture of bent knees in our heart, submission, humility, reliance, love, trust, He has called you, all of you, every saint, to comprehend this. And now he's starting to describe it. There's actually dimensions to it, so you can identify it. This isn't just intuitive or something that, you know, it's it's totally relativistic. It's intuitive. It's so abstract that no one really knows. Like, we couldn't say. It's just, hey, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? How do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? It's got dimensions, But there's something else important to know about these dimensions. He wants you to comprehend breadth, length, height, depth. What's he saying? He's actually saying, not that this is all so um, mysterious that you can't really know it, but that the dimensions are beyond measure. The dimensions of what? His love which is his glory. His glory is displayed in everything that he is and does. So it's displayed in his wrath too. But the peak, the mountaintop of his glory is displayed in you, church. The product of his love. His glorious love. Whereby he would give his own son to be broken, to save and reclaim you to your rightful mission and identity. So, these dimensions, the idea is, as far as you want to go this way, looking, looking at his, his love. As far as you want to go, let's say we're lo- I'm looking at a map, so you'd be this way. You know, I guess this is east, this is west. Right, kids? You know, as, as, as far as you want to go, west or east? If I want to go east, looking at his love, looking at his love, looking at his love. Look, I am never going to hit a wall. I will never get to the end of his love to the east. To the west, I will never, ever, ever hit a cap on his love. If I could climb up into the sky, I will never, ever, ever, ever reach the summit of his love in Christ. And nor if I dive down. So is the idea, okay, don't bother with that. It's a goal you can't achieve. Don't try to grasp his love. No, it's the exact opposite. Nor is he saying, hey, don't worry about thinking or knowledge because this is just blows your mind. It's beyond knowledge. He's saying that his glorious grace is boundless towards you. And here's the idea. He tells us more. He goes further. 
So there's two things in this second request. He says, he's praying, Paul, teaching you how to pray, how to think, what to pursue. He says, so that, this is number two under Paul's prayer request, so that you might have the strength of Christ in you, right, to comprehend with all the saints this width, length, height, and depth, to know, he goes further. So when he's saying to comprehend, he's saying he wants you to know. And the way I characterized it is the knowledge of, surpassing love knowledge surpassing love of Christ this doesn't mean that there's nothing to know that there's no knowledge so just pack it in or or mail it in it's the exact opposite what it means is it's his love is so it matches who he is he is love he is truth he is justice he is all that he has So in his love, he is absolutely just. So the more you know about his justice, the more you know about his love. The more you know about his love, the more you know about his justice. And there's no limit because he's infinite. These attributes tell you who he is. In Christ, his love toward you through the cross, it surpasses a cap on knowledge. It doesn't mean that it's purely intuitive or that you can't know it because he just says, He's praying that you would have the strength to comprehend and to know. I pray that you would have the strength to comprehend and to know. So then when he says that it's it's love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, is he contradicting himself? I want you to have the strength to comprehend and to know. But it's the love of Christ that it's beyond knowledge. Did he like bump his head and, and like lose train of thought and he doesn't know what he's talking about? No. He's saying he wants you to know it. And the idea here is this. It's revealed in the last request. So that, the third so that, number three, in verse 19. Thank you. So that you might be filled. He doesn't just want you to know that you have Christ in you through the Holy Spirit, but by faith, he wants you to pursue your calling, to actively chase after him as your treasure. To be filled. He wants you to build on that foundation. To cultivate the plant coming out of the root that is Christ in you. To pursue fullness. And what that presupposes is that you could be full of this knowledge. You could fill yourself with all this knowledge revealed in here. So that you love him. And that you will keep growing. Because there's no bounds. There's no limits to his love. Or the knowledge of an infinite God who is infinitely love, infinitely glorious, infinitely gracious towards you. There's no bounds. So that, verse 19, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. There's no end point to that. That means right now you're practicing the habits of building an internal life of Christ, love for God in this word. You're, you're, you're starting the habits right now in this world that you will pursue for the rest of eternity. You will keep growing. Your capacity as a vessel to know him, to see him, to love him, will grow and grow and grow. And the picture is of you being filled. He wants you to be filled with the knowledge of him. Love for him who loved you first through these truths. Such that it's like, picture you like a fountain. You're full, but you're overflowing. It's like the water, that, which is God's glorious grace, his truth, his, his person. It's overflowing. And for eternity, you, the fountain, the vessel, you're just going to expand and grow in your capacity to adore him, to know him, to see him. You're going to take in more knowledge, more beauty, more treasure, more treasure. You're going to expand and expand and expand and expand. There is no limit. And it will become more and more exponentially more delightful to you because he is Glory itself. He wants you to pursue that now. Now he finishes with a doxology because the right response is, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to live this Christian life. The point of all that theology is for you to love God, to know God, to be a theologian, to pursue him in his word. And so what's the goal of all that? That God would be glorified in you from your inner life to your outer life. And he he closes exactly as he wants your life to look. This passage has the shape that he wants your life to take. To the one who is able. And I I translate it to the one. This is verse 20. We're on 20 to 21 now. 
We're coming to a close. To the one who is able to do super abundantly above anything and everything. So the idea is this is the sovereign God. And anything that you could want, anything you could imagine to ask for, anything that you do ask for, he says, he could do super abundantly above any of that. And, number two, not just what you ask, but anything that you could even think so the point is that if, if, if you recognize that this is your God and he means to be your treasure for your whole world to revolve around him, you won't be disappointed. He's not going to underdeliver. He not only can do more than what you're asking, but he is and does and gives more, infinitely more than you will even dream of wanting to ask or love or enjoy. Stop messing around with cheap Counterfeits, false gods, unsatisfying, created things that do not have the prerogative and the right to be your God. Stop playing with the things that shouldn't, they don't have the right to be your motivator. They don't have the right to fill up your internal life and to rule you. Only this God revealed in the person and work of Christ, the triune God, has the right to and the power to satisfy you forever. You are his. His love is limitless. Limitless. And so to him, verse 21. Oh, I'm sorry. The last part of verse 20. According to the power working within us. And what did I tell you that power is? It's just a mysterious thing. The Holy Spirit's just doing stuff. No matter what you do. You could go become a prostitute and just forget about Christ altogether. But because you prayed a prayer, you walked down an aisle during a hymn, uh, you're good right? You're good? This is going to happen? The power of the Holy Spirit's going to work in you no matter what? No. The power of the Holy Spirit working in you is that he's given you a new nature, a new desire, a new motive. But you, if you are really that person who's been born again, you have a calling and a mandate to pursue it, to pray like pra Paul's prayer, to live this for this. According to that power of a new motive, of a new desire, a new happiness. So to him, verse 21, verse 21 in closing. For to him be the glory in the church, the saints, and in Christ Jesus. Now, so is he making a distinction? Like, I want to be glorified in the church, and I also would like to be glorified in Christ. Is that what he's doing? He's doing the same thing he's done here through this whole passage. He's saying one thing, so glory to God in the church, and then he's explaining. He's giving you another angle. He's opening up what he means. He's showing you more about what he means. So when he says glory to God in the church, glory to God in Christ. You are united to Christ. Glory to God in Christ is glory to God in the church. The true church is glory to God in Christ. You are united to this Christ. You are his possession. Your inner life and outer life belong to him entirely. And that is for God's glory and for none other. For none other. And he closes, throughout all generations. Essentially, he's saying when he says forever and ever, that's very romantic, like poetic. He's saying for eternity. This is for eternity. These things he's praying for, this isn't a moment this isn't a fleeting thing, and then we're on to something else. What we've described here, this is your identity and your calling. Forever you will be savoring him. Love this word. Train yourself now. Take hold of your calling. Not just to be moral, to be a worshiper. To be a worshiper. And lastly, if this is your experience, if this is who you are, should blessing and cursing be coming out of the same mouth? If this is your, your calling and who you are, and you could sit through a three-hour football game or a two-hour, three-hour movie and not even blink, you're just enjoying your chips and you're so happy, but uh, uh, you know, a 45-minute to an hour sermon is torturous. Now, I'm talking about a faithful one. I'm not saying I'm any kind of genius of preaching, but I'm saying faithful biblical preaching. Just faithful. If that three-hour football game is like, <laughs> woo! And the word of God is like, man, get me home. 
Get me home. I did my thing. I showed up. You know, showing up at a church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years doesn't make you the church. You know that? You know that, right? You are born again. You're the church because Christ is living in you. He's given you a new nature. He's given you a new agenda. And so cursing shouldn't be coming out of the same mouth that blessing comes out of. Grumbling, gossip, ugliness. We need to pursue our new identity in Christ so that all the glory would be to him in his church in Christ forever and ever. Amen? Amen. So, um, I'm going to give a blessing, and I want to um, call up some people to um, vote them into membership. Uh, So, please, anyone who's a member here, stick around for that, for the vote into membership. Um, Only members, of course. And um, to all of you in general, I say this, you know, may the uh, grace of Jesus Christ, love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Be blessed this week as you pursue this identity, this calling, to access and experience Christ in you, Christ in you, to be empowered by you actually laboring to comprehend. Love his word and bless the world as you are blessed because you know and love God and the person and work of Jesus Christ. You may be dismissed. Um, our doxology, and and then we're going to have our vote. Sorry. I'm going to sing with you, and then we'll vote. Mm -hmm.